Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NFL Week 10 episode of the Bacon Bets podcast. The road to 272 bets has hit the halfway point. Uh, yeah, nine weeks down of an 18-week regular season. That means we are halfway through the NFL season. We're also halfway through the 2024 edition of the road to 272. So before I get into my picks for Week 10, uh, I'm going to w- recap kind of what has been going on the first half of the season with my bets uh, but before I even get into that, I am going to do just a quick recap uh, of the New York Marathon. If you follow me on Twitter, I was kind of live tweeting it. Uh, I was talking about it the past few weeks on the podcast. If you don't want to listen to this, I don't blame you. Check the description in the YouTube video or the audio version of this podcast. Just go ahead and skip to the picks if that's what you're here for. But uh, I will talk about the New York Marathon one final last time. Like I said, I did live tweet it. Uh, I do have to shout out the people. I did a contest. If you follow me on Twitter on Sunday, I said uh, to reply to the tweet uh, with your prediction for what my final uh, time would be at the race at the New York Marathon. Uh, the three people who got the closest. My final time, by the way, four hours, 41 minutes, and 29 seconds, which is uh, just an insanely long time uh, to be running. So shout out to uh, Kevin Alter. Uh, I don't have their exact guesses here in front of me, uh, but these were the three winners who, who guessed uh, the closest. Kevin Alter at NJD Calty, Jared Mello at Jared Mello 33 uh and mike thrall at thrall underscore mike mike if you're listening to this uh you haven't responded to my dm uh i need your venmo to send you your 50 dollars that you want so congrats congratulations to those three and fuck all you people who <laughs> responded your guesses for like five hours and 45 minutes all right two guys were like you're not gonna finish my guess is you're gonna get sick and not finish uh i did finish uh believe it or not Four hours, 41 minutes, um, 29 seconds. My goal was to break four hours and 40 minutes, so I actually missed my goal by 90 seconds. But this is my first ever marathon. I will take four hours and 41 minutes and 29 seconds as my first ever marathon. Also, the New York Marathon, famously known for an extremely difficult marathon. It was extremely difficult, especially the second half. Um, I actually hit the halfway point. I was feeling good at the start. My heart rate was a little high. Uh, So I actually didn't feel the best I felt. I've had some training runs uh, that I had uh, felt a little bit better in where my heart rate was a little bit lower at a little bit faster pace, but I still felt pretty good. I hit cruise control, uh, felt like I could go at that pace kind of forever, which is what you want when you start a marathon. I hit the half marathon mark at four hours and 16 minutes, a little over that, I believe. So I was on pace to run a 432. I knew the second half was going to be harder, not only because the second half of marathon is always going to be harder, but because the course itself is harder in the second half. But I still felt confident at the halfway mark of 416. Um, I thought if I ran like a, you know, obviously like like a 420 uh, in the second half, um, then I would still be able to break 440. Uh, felt good up until, I mean, the famous wall. Everyone uh, who has run a marathon, if you've run one before, you know what I'm talking about. But if you listen to people talk about running marathons, uh, there is a wall you hit at 32 kilometers um, or 20 miles, depending on if you go by kilometers or miles. Um, uh, marathon, by the way, if you don't know, it is 42.2 kilometers or uh, 26.2 miles. So it's always the last 10 kilometers or the last uh, six miles that is the hardest. They say it is a 32 kilometer warm up for a 10 kilometer race um, or 20 mile warm up for a six mile race. Uh, and I truly felt that I knew it was going to be hard. Um, the final 10, it did hit me, especially in my legs a little bit harder than I expected. My calves specifically, uh, seized up on me. I was a sprinter my whole life. Uh, I ran track and field, the 100 meter and 200 meter, uh, in high school. I was a running back in football. Uh, I think my body, my legs are a little bit more built for sprinting than long distance, Um, and, uh, yeah, my legs kind of gave a out on me, but I still managed to finish. I mean, it, it it did slow me down my second half pretty, uh, significantly slower than my first half, but still not terrible. Uh, I I didn't have to completely stop at any point in the race, still four hours and 41 minutes and 29 seconds for my first ever marathon. I'm happy with that. I've set a bar for myself. Uh, I'll be running the New York marathon again next year. Uh, so now I just got to see, uh, how much I can, uh, beat that time by, um, yeah, very. It, it was difficult. It was a tough race. Uh, it was an amazing experience. Uh, thank you all to uh, the people who uh, you know tweeting at me and sending me DMs, uh, wishing me good luck and and supporting me. That that really meant a lot. It was an unbelievably cool experience. Uh, I mean, 
55,000 people run that race, all five boroughs through New York. Uh, the streets just crowded with people supporting all the runners the entire race through. The atmosphere was unbelievable. It was truly one of the coolest experiences of my life. Now, what I will say about running the marathon, um, and this is going to be a little bit of a hot take. Some people might hate me for this take. Uh, but I, I read, because I read and I watched everything I possibly could about people running marathons leading into it. Uh, a lot of people after they run a marathon say it's the hardest thing they've ever done. If you say that, there's two things. Number one, you didn't train hard enough. Because, I mean, I had been preparing for this for, a, a, you know, a, almost two years now, at least running. Uh, I started an 18-week training program that I followed to a T. I started that at uh, early July. Um, and yeah, it was hard. The last 10 kilometers, six miles was very difficult. If that's the hardest thing in, that you've ever done in your life, you either didn't train hard enough or you need to experience some more hardships because <laughs> running with your legs very sore for 10 kilometers shouldn't be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. Uh, the training itself was harder than actually running the marathon. So, uh, yeah, it was very difficult. It, it was hard. My legs hurt, but, uh, I, I mean, I've seen so many people say, at the end of a marathon. That was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Well, you should be lucky then. Experience some more hardships about that. Or train harder. Because if you didn't train for a marathon and then you tried to run it, it will be it will be hell. If I felt like I did at mile 20, if I felt that way in mile 10, uh, that would have been hell. Um, but listen, I was, you know, when I, when I first decided to start running, I was two years ago, I was 250 pounds. I was the most Otis shape I'd ever been in my life. I could barely run two kilometers, let, uh, you know, let alone 42.2 kilometers. Um, and then it took a year and a half of running and then plus an 18 week training program. And I was able to get in good enough shape and lose enough weight that I could run a marathon in 441. So if a marathon's the hardest thing you've ever done, just number one, train, or maybe a little bit harder or number two experience more hardships or don't experience more hardships and live the you know the rest of your life with the marathon being the hardest thing you've ever done that's my hot take about a marathon very difficult but not even close to the hardest thing uh i've ever done in my life uh i set a bar for myself gotta break it next year uh when i do the marathon next year uh, all right, I promise I'm done talking about the marathon. I've talked about it too much on this podcast. I've posted about it on social media too much. Uh, to be fair, though, the entire point of running a marathon is to brag about it on social media uh, to get uh, internet likes. So uh, I think I've milked that for all it's worth. I promise no more marathon talk until this time next year. How about that? The rest of the football season, I won't even mention the word marathon again starting now. I'll say it one more time. Marathon. I ran a marathon. All right, I'm done. Uh, let's move on to uh, a little bit of a recap for the first half of the road to 272 bets. So last week, unfortunately, another uh, losing week, but it was just another 500 week. Thanks to uh, thankfully won both on Sunday Night Football and Primetime Football. Uh, so I went 7-7-1 seven, seven, and one for minus 0.5 units. Obviously, I couldn't watch um, all the games on Sunday for a certain reason. Uh, so I don't have, you know, I, I don't really have a good sense if, it, you know, I lost because of uh, some bad luck. I mean, I do know the Patriots, I think that was the final play of the game. The Patriots scored a touchdown where Drake May was running all over the place to tie the game and going overtime. That Titans ended up pushing, you know, that if they didn't get that final touchdown on the, on the last play of the game, that would have been a Titans win. Uh, what else do we have? I'm just going through uh, the my bets here now. Uh, Eagles were covering the entire game. Jaguars got a bit of a backdoor cover there. So that one stung a little bit. Bears wasn't close. Broncos wasn't close. Saints, by all metrics, I didn't watch it, but by the box score, outperformed the, the Panthers and still found a way to lose. Yeah. So really, I think the only one I have a huge issue with, um, I mean, the backdoor cover for the Jaguars, that sucks, but that kind of happens. Uh, the biggest one I have an issue with based on the highlights I watched was the pa or the Titans, uh, ending in a push instead of a win but at the end of the day seven seven one small loss minus 0.5 units we are still profitable for the season for the road to 272 and that is the goal so through the first half of the 2024 edition of the road to 272 bets i'm sitting at 72 wins 65 losses two pushes for plus 1.61 units not great would obviously love to be up a lot more um, but my goal is every season to finish the year profitable. And right now we are at the halfway point and we are profitable. It's not much, but a profit, uh, is certainly a profit. Um, because we're at the halfway point, just to kind of dive into the numbers uh, a little bit more here, I brought up actually how I'm doing on it, each type of bet. 
And by the way, I will recap the prop bets during the prop bet show. Uh, but in terms of my side and totals, uh, money lines are where I'm kind of losing here. Uh, so for my money line upset picks this season, I'm three and eight for minus 3.35 units. Uh, you know, the season I had was that last year was profitable. Two years ago was a loss three years ago. With, so it was three years ago when I won like over 20 units on the season, I hit a lot of money line upset picks. Uh, the past two years, those have not gone well, and that's kind of what's held me back. Uh, so I'm losing on my upset picks. Uh, my spread bets, I'm around even. I'm 54, 49, and 2 for plus 0.16 units. So I'm basically even with spreads. Thankfully, where I have had my most success is betting on the total. Uh, with my totals bets this season, I'm 14 and 8 for plus 4.8 units. So my totals are kind of what saved me, but I think this was the case last year too. I think in the first half, I did very well with total bets, and that kind of regressed as the season went on. But spread and money line picks got better as the season went on compared to the first half. Well, so we'll see uh, if that's kind of how the way the things uh, will shake out again uh, this year. Uh, so yeah, losing money on money lines, basically even for spreads, winning money on totals is kind of has been the story of the season uh, so far. Um, all right, let's. It's time to kind of get into the second half of the season. And if you like money line upset picks, I'm trying to win all that money back that I've lost on money line upset picks this season all in one week. Because I got two. I got one that's north of two to one odds. I got one that's north of three to one odds. Uh, so if you like upset picks, this is the week for you. I think that's all I wanted to say about the recap. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, you know, back-to-back -back losing weeks. Weeks They haven't been terrible weeks, but, I mean, this is kind of how I imagine things going in a season is I'm going to have losing weeks, but keep the losing weeks to small losses, and the winning weeks should be big losses, or, sorry, should be big wins. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to, you know, finish the season profitable. You got to avoid, you got to avoid the killer weeks. You're going to have losing weeks. You got to avoid like the four and 10, you know, the five and five and 11 weeks. You got to avoid those weeks. If you avoid those weeks, you're probably going to be okay uh, by the end of the season. So let's get into it. It is time to enter into the second half of the road to 272 bets. Uh, continue with me on this long journey. Let's dive into it. My best bet for all week 10 games. <gasps> I'm not a state. I'm a monster. <laughs> no, Lisa. The only monster here is the gambling monster that has enslaved your mother. I call him Gamblor, and it's time to snatch your mother from his neon claws. All right, let's get into it. Thursday night football. Uh, generally, Thursday night football has been bad games past few years this season as well. Uh, we got a banger for Thursday night football. This week, it is AFC North between the Ravens and the Bengals. Obviously, uh, a big game for both teams that kind of need wins. Ravens need to win to keep pace with the Steelers. Bengals need to win to kind of get back into the playoff mix in the AFC. Uh, Ravens, six, six and a half point favorites. Uh, I told you before uh, at the end of the intro there uh, that I have some underdog upset picks uh, at a pretty decent price this week. The first one... We're starting off with a bang, baby. Give me the Cincinnati Bengals plus 220 to upset the Baltimore Ravens on Thursday night football. I've told you guys I have an issue with this Ravens team. Their offense very, very, very good. Their defense is bad. Um, I definitely don't want to lay the points on the Ravens. I thought about just taking the points with the Bengals, but I thought, hey, let's get aggressive. Let's get back to our old way. Let's get back to the way that we, you know, won a ton of money a few years ago when I just took some shots and some underdogs that I liked at big prices. This is a great opportunity for that. The Bengals defense, I say it every week. I'll say it again. Um, terrible in, uh, secondary. They're giving up 7 point yards per pass attempt. They rank 29th in opponent drop back EPA, 23rd in opponent drop back success rate, and now they have to take on one of the better uh, passing offenses in the NFL in the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, a passing offense that ranks 5 in just about all of those metrics. Um, and also, I mean, you look at the last time these two teams played, week 5, this game was in Cincinnati, to be fair. This one's in Baltimore. Uh, but the Ravens uh, needed overtime to beat the Bengals. And you look at some of the numbers here. I mean, Joe Burrow went 30 for 39, 392 yards and five touchdowns. It's going to be hard for the Bang for the Ravens to beat the Bengals again if Joe Burrow once again throws for almost 400 yards uh, and five touchdowns. 
Um, the Bengals defense, by the way, they're horrific to start the season, a bottom five defense. They're still not a good defense, uh, but they have certainly uh, trended in the right direction. They're now kind of like a average to below average defense. So I actually think defensively, the slight edge goes to the Bengals. Um, offensively, I would still probably say the slight edge goes to the Ravens because of how well they can run the football. Um, but I mean, those two things kind of cancel each other out. It is a divisional game. Upsets ha happen in divisional games. It's a Thursday night football game. Weird things happen on Thursday night football. Um, I'm going to take a shot here on the Bengals as an underdog. I think this is a great opportunity if you want a, a, a north, a two to one underdog. If you don't want to take a shot on a big underdog, take the six, six and a half points. Um, let me double check what the spread is sitting at here now. If you want, would rather bet the spread. Uh, the best price you can get on the Bengals is six. So this has actually come down. Uh, I even think earlier today it was six and a half across the board. The best price right now for at least New York regulated books is bet MGM plus six minus one Oh five. So you can take the six points with the Bengals. Um, I think the plus what plus two twenty money line is still available at bet MGM. So if you want to be conservative, take the spread. I I'm taking a couple shots and this is one of them this week. So my idea, and I'll get to the other upset in a little bit later on in the show. Um, but it, like I said, I have a plus two twenty underdog and a plus three ten underdog. If one of them hits, we're sitting with a nice uh, a nice profit. So uh, if both of them hit, we're absolutely laughing this week. Um, so let let's see if we can cash at least one of them. It'd be nice to start off the week with a with a plus two twenty winner. Uh, moving on to Sunday's slate, it is um, the last international game of the season. It is the <laughs> it's the Giants and the Panthers. It's uh, the United States uh, getting back uh, at Germany one more time for World War II by having to make them go watch the Giants and the Panthers. Um, tough. I will take the Giants in this one, minus four and a half. I bet against the Panthers last week. I said, don't overthink it. Don't get cute betting on the Bengals. Uh, la or sorry, betting on the Panthers, uh, and you should have got cute betting on the Panthers last week, but you know, they're obviously going to cover at some points. They're going to win a game here or there. Um, that is not enough for me to now want to back, back the Panthers, uh, this week. Cause even in that game against the saints, they got outplayed. You look at yards per play. They still got outplayed 5.8 yards per play for the saints, 4.9 for the Panthers. They just had some things, uh, go their way and they, then they ended up getting the win at the end of the day. This Panthers team is still. The worst team in the NFL, in my opinion, 30th in EPA per play, 32nd in opponent EPA per play. Um, there's nothing to really like about Carolina. Don't forget. I mean, I, I'm assuming Bryce Young is going to start again this week. Bryce Young is still Bryce Young. They have very few, if any, redeeming qualities. At least the Giants, for as bad as they are, have some redeeming qualities. Number one, they can rush the passer. Number two, they can th throw the football. Uh, Tyrone Tracy. Uh, he's had a fantastic season for them. Uh, they got a pretty solid weapon out there in Malik Neighbors. I mean, the Giants have some positives. They certainly have a ton of negatives too, um, but there's not a single positive I can find about the Carolina Panthers, except for shout out fellow Canadian Chuba Hubbard, who might actually be having the most underrated season uh, in the NFL this uh, this year. Chuba Hubbard is fifth in the NFL right now in total rushing yards, 665. Shout out Canadian. People forget. Uh, Alberta, I believe. Uh, where's Chuba Hubbard from? Sherwood Park, which I think is in Alberta. Yep. Uh, shout out Chuba Hubbard. People forget, and no one actually even knows this unless you're like a hardcore Canadian football fan. We had a guy who actually could have, was even better than Chuba Hubbard, um, who came up this, when I did, uh, in the Canadian football world, he was obviously much better than me. Tyler Varga, um, Played high school football in Canada. Went to Yale on a scholarship. Dominated Yale. Was a, like the best Ivy League running back they had seen in years. Signed with the Colts. Got a concussion his rookie season. Never came back to the NFL. He was also super smart. He like ended up, I think he's a doctor now. Or like a surgeon or something. So he got one concussion. Was like, no, nah, I'm not going to screw my brain up. I'm just going to go be a doctor instead. Um, no one is going to know this except for me. Because I was obviously hardcore into Canadian football coming up. Tyler Varga could have been like a like a top three running back in the NFL of his generation. I think if he could have stayed healthy and would have got some chances, I seen him play live at the can of the cup. When I was coming up playing for team Nova Scotia, that guy was unbelievable. Um, Tyler Varga, look him up. He was like the son of, he was like our Canadian Christian McCaffrey. He was like the son of like two Olympians. Uh, it was crazy. Um, also 
very clearly looked like he did steroids when I saw him in person. He was jacked with back acne, uh, just mountains of zits on his back, and just jacked as like a 17-year-old. It was bananas to see. Um, anyways, Chuba Hubbard, very underrated season. Still not enough to convince me to bet on the Panthers. I will take the Giants. That was a, a, a kind of a, a, a tangent that I didn't really need to go on. Uh, the job still betting on the Giants. Minus four and a half. The Panthers have no redeeming qualities. All their stats and metrics suck. I'll take the Giants. Uh, moving on to uh, the 1 p.m. slate, the Patriots and the Bears. Who gives a shit about this game? I guess it is a battle of two rookie quarterbacks. That's kind of interesting. We didn't get. Uh, we did get the number one and number two. Now we got the number one and number three quarterbacks uh, dueling it out. I will go under 39 and a half. Um, I will fade both. Rookie quarterbacks under 39 and a half minus 110 between the Patriots uh, and the Chicago Bears. If I can find my notes here, I kind of lost it looking up Chuba Hubbard. Uh, where are my notes? I just completely uh, got off them because I was there. They are right there. Uh, this is basically the offenses for both teams stink. The defenses are much better and the offenses, especially the Bears defense. If you look at just moving the ball down the field, which is obviously very important when it comes to scoring points, the Patriots and the Bears are 30th and 31st in yards per play, 25th and 31st in third down conversion rate. Uh, they struggle to keep offensive drives alive. I have had faith in the Bears the past two weeks. They played against two bad defenses in a row. I bet on them both weeks. They played against the Commanders. They played against the Cardinals and they put up... Nothing burgers in those games. Uh, I'm done um, having faith in the Bears offense. They might just be a bad offense. That little blip where they went on a two or three game stretch where they look competent was um, uh, wrong. The Bears might stink. They're, I don't know if it's coaching. I don't know if it's Caleb Williams. I don't know if it's, you know, lack of talent. I don't know if it's an offensive line, but their, their offense stinks. Uh, the Patriots offense also stinks. Uh, meanwhile, the Bears defense, obviously one of the better units in the NFL, um, eighth in opponent, third down conversion rate, third in red zone defense, secondary numbers off the charts. 39 and a half is a pretty low total, but I still like it, uh, like it going under there. So we'll go under 39 and a half between the Patriots, uh, and the bears Vikings Jaguars. This is one of the easier bets of the week. In my opinion, although the Jaguars have now pulled off two straight backdoor covers against the Packers and then the Eagles, I'll fade them again this week. I don't care. Cause Let's keep things as simple as possible. We have a game between one of the best defenses in the NFL and one of the worst defenses in the NFL. Heading into this week, the Vikings rank second in opponent EPA per play. The Jaguars rank dead last in the NFL in opponent EPA per play. Um, and even if you look at the offensive numbers, slight edge to Minnesota once again, 14th in EPA per play. Jacksonville, 17th in EPA per play. And then if you want to throw in my favorite st statistic, net yards per play, uh, the Vikings are 6th in the NFL at plus 0.5. The Jaguars are 23rd at minus 0.4. So I just don't see anything to justify a bet on the Jaguars. I think Christian Kirk going down obviously hurts the Jaguars' offense. I think they've, you know, by the skin of their teeth, have now had two backdoor covers. The Eagles, based on what I've seen from fourth down conversions they should have got and Misplay here and a misplay there. Still got the win, but they should have won that game by 20. This Jaguars team is not good. Um, I will take the Vikings to win uh, and cover here in this one, minus four. Uh, Steelers and Commanders. Another under bet for me this week in this one. Uh, Steelers, Commanders under 46, uh, minus 110. A uh, little bit of an interesting one here because we have two teams who I think are overperforming. Um, but maybe not. But the Steelers, we know they have a very good defense, but they are probably overperforming a little bit. Can Russell Wilson keep playing as as well as he has the past two weeks? We'll see. Um, I need more of a two-game sample size before I can kind of buy in on Russell Wilson based on, you know, his performances in Denver. But my issue with the Commanders, and I have, you know, praised the Commanders recently. I, I bet on them last week. My issue with the Commanders has been is their schedule. Um, you know, praise the commanders all you want. They deserve a lot of praise, but let's look at the teams that they faced. They have played the Buccaneers, Giants, Bengals, Com or, uh, Cardinals, Browns, Ravens, Panthers, Bears, Giants again. They have played one team. I believe it's just one team with a winning record. Um, 
because the Bucks have a losing record. So the only team they, they have played with a winning record is the Ravens. And they lost by a touchdown. Uh, the Cardinals actually have a winning record. Uh, and they actually, that was probably the most impressive game of the season was when they did beat up uh, on the Arizona Cardinals. But not only, so, and I've talked about it before, EPA per play, commanders in a league all by themselves, they, they've been that good. Jaden Daniels, obviously rookie of the year in the conversation for MVP. It's not even the records of the teams they're playing. Even the good teams they've playing have they've played have had bad defenses. They've only played one team so far whose defense currently ranks in the top half of the NFL in opponent EPA per play. That team was the Chicago Bears. The Commanders had their worst offensive performance of the season against them. They only scored 18 points. Every other team that they've played currently ranks in the bottom half of the NFL in opponent EPA per play. The Buccaneers, the Giants, the Bengals, the Cardinals, the Browns, the Panthers, the Bear, uh, the Ravens. So even though they are exceeding expectations you know by every sense of the word all of their opponents is that one have been in the bottom half of the nfl in defense now they got some good defensive opponents actually not even really they got the steel the steelers are going to be the best steelers and eagles the next two weeks are going to be the best at titans later on good defense too um, but now they have to face a very good defense last time they played a good defense they only scored 18 points um, the Steelers are going to be a low scoring team to begin with because they run the ball. They play good defense. Uh, I'm surprised this total is at 46. I love this bet. I will go under 46 between the Steelers and commanders. I think we're going to be a little bit, we're going to see a little bit of regression, uh, from the commanders offense. Uh, next up we have the bills and the Colts. Um, and I'm actually going to take the Colts plus four and a half, uh, at home in this one. I got some concerns for the Bills. I have bet on the Bills recently. Um, I took the Dolphins against them last week, though, with the points. The Bills have not played well on the road, which is a concern for me in this one. They're, they have a net yards per play of minus 0.7 on the road this season. Their average scoring margin drops from plus 17.5 to plus 3.4 uh, when on the at home compared to on the road. And I do think the Colts are going to be able to run the ball successfully. And if they do run the ball well against the Bills, a Bills team that allows 4.8 yards per carry, they can stay in this game. Obviously, the other thing worth mentioning, the Colts are a much different team with Joe Flacco, a quarterback, compared to Anthony Richardson. Uh, Joe Flacco is certainly not an elite quarterback this season. Elite quarterback, whether or not he's an elite quarterback in his career is a different conversation. But this season, not elite, uh, but significantly better than Anthony Richardson. I'm willing to take the points with the Colts, plus four and a half at home, with Joe Flacco, a quarterback, and with some question marks about the Bills, specifically uh, when they're playing on the road, which they have not had their best performances when playing on the road this season. So give me Colts plus four and a half uh, at minus uh, 110. Broncos and the Chiefs. Uh, I'll take. I'll do this last pick and then I'll take a break. I will take the Broncos plus nine and a half at minus 115 in this one. If you've been watching and listening to this podcast all season, you should not be surprised by this because I've been betting on the Broncos almost every single week. Uh, and I've been betting against the Chiefs at least the last two weeks. Don't forget the Chiefs were 10-point favorites to the Raiders. They failed to cover. Nine-point favorites to the Buccaneers this past week. Failed to cover. Now they're on a short week. Um, and they once again have to take on one of the better defenses in the NFL, the Broncos. Who, yes, they just got their asses kicked by the Ravens. Um, but I'm not ready to completely give up on the Broncos despite that bad performance. Um, against Baltimore I think you got to be pretty brave I think you got to be brave to lay you know 10 points nine and a half points on a Chiefs team based on how well they've played they've been playing recently now I have figured out the Chiefs I figured out why the Chiefs are able to do what they've done because you look at their metrics especially offensively not good this season you watch them they don't look that good but they continue to win games and I have figured out why I'm going to talk. I'm going to make a video tomorrow about it, though. But it comes down to third down. The Chiefs, first down, second down, average to below average. Third down, they turn into the best team in the NFL. And I don't know how or why. I don't know if that's coaching. I don't know if that's like the the clutch gene that Patrick Mahomes seems seems to have. But I'm going to make a little bit more of an in-depth video of, of, of that 
tomorrow because I want to see the updated numbers from tonight's game. I don't have them updated right now, but they were even better on third down tonight against the Buccaneers. So when I get the updated numbers about their third down play on offense, I'm going to make a video about it tomorrow because it's unbelievable. Um, with that being said, I mean, I, the Chiefs are probably going to win this game. Have they been good enough for me to want to bet on them to, to cover nine and a half point spread as favorites? Nope. Not a chance. And I did tweet this out. Um, am I allowed to call the back-to-back defending champs frauds if they're one of the most undeserving eight no teams of all time? I don't think I can because they are the back-to-back champs. Um, and they probably will get hot heading into the playoffs and win the Super Bowl again. I don't want to be the guy calling the Chiefs frauds and then they win a third straight Super Bowl. They don't deserve to be 8-0, though. But maybe they do based on the third down offense. I need to explore this a little bit more tomorrow. But at the end of the day, I no matter if you think they're frauds or if you think they're the best team in the NFL, I don't think they deserve being 9.5 point favorites against one of the best defense in the NFL in Denver. I'll take Broncos plus 9.5. Um, All right, time for a quick break, uh, and I'll be back in just a moment to break down the rest of my picks for NFL Week 10. All right, let's keep things rolling. Let's start with my Atlanta Falcons in New Orleans uh, with a chance to improve to 7-3 on the season, 5-0 in the NFC South, and I'm going to bet on them to do exactly that. I incorrectly uh, went on the Cowboys last week. I should not have done that, but I just don't know how you could bet on the Saints. I actually kind of did want to take the three points of the Saints for a bit, and I think I would have if they had Chris Olave, so I doubt based on what I've heard about that injury he's going to be playing this week. If Chris Olave does come back and you can get Saints plus three, it might be worth a look. Also, it does concern me they fired Dennis Allen because, I mean, how many times does an interim coach win their first game uh, as interim coach? I mean, if Jeff Saturday can win a game as his first interim coach with a uh, game as the interim coach with the Colts, Anyone can do it. Uh, with that being said, I mean, this this Saints team is completely imploded. Um, they're giving up the second most yards per play on defense, a defense which was supposed to be good. Um, it's just, I, I don't see how the Saints can compete with Atlanta. They have their coach fire, their best offensive weapon in Chris Olave is probably sideline. Their defense, abysmal numbers week after week. Uh, and the Falcons, for what it's worth, once again, didn't watch the game just based on the bo- box score. They did fix their two biggest issues on defense. Or I, I don't want to say fixed because... I don't know if it's going to be a permanent solution, but they at least improved in their areas. Number one, much better on third down. Uh, Cowboys converted only 23% of the third down conversions against them. And number two, they're able to record three sacks, which is crazy. If we could just record three sacks every week, we're a Super Bowl team. Uh, the third down issue is a little bit more promising because uh, that is something I think they can fix. The pass rush, they're probably not going to continue to get three sacks. Still, regardless, their defense is moving in the right direction. I don't know what you have if you're going to bet on the Saints in this one. Unless Chris Olave starts, no receivers, defense stinks, the whole locker room is imploding. Who knows who's going to be their interim coach? I think you just have to, at this point, bet the Falcons and hope for the best. So I'll take Atlanta minus three, minus 115 in New Orleans. 49ers, Buccaneers, I will take the 49ers minus six and a half, minus 105 in this one against Tampa Bay. 49ers have a lot of things um, go working for them this week. Uh, number one, Christian McCaffrey looks like he's going to be back in the lineup for San Francisco. That's obviously huge. Number two, despite being 4-4, four and four, the 49ers have actually played, in my opinion, some pretty solid football this, uh, football this season. They are currently second in the NFL right now in net yards per play behind only the Baltimore Ravens. So that paired with getting Christian McCaffrey likely back this week is going to be huge especially because we have now kind of seen what the Buccaneers offer with no Chris Godwin or Mike Evans. They're going to try to run the ball as much as they possibly can. If they throw the ball, they're going to throw a ton to Kate Otten. Being that kind of, you know, I don't want to say one-dimensional, but one-and-a-half dimensional, you got a run game and a tight end with no receivers, um, that's not going to work. That's not going to fly um, against the San Francisco 49ers, especially, I mean, maybe they could make it work if they had an elite defense, but the Buccaneers' defense has been... Truly horrific. Um, So I will take the 49ers to come off their bye week with a little bit of a statement win here against Tampa Bay. I will take San Francisco minus 6.5, minus 105. Moving on to the Tennessee Titans and the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, If you guessed this was my my other upset pick of the week, you are a winner. Um, Give me the Tennessee Titans plus 310 to defeat... 
the Los Angeles Chargers. If you want to take them on the spread, I believe they're seven and a half on the spread, but I'm going to take a shot on the Titans. No, no person, and I really have no reason for it this season, but no person uh, should have had should have the faith in the Titans that I have had this season. I've bet on them every, almost every single week. They pushed for me last week in, in a game they should have covered. Uh, now I'm going to take them to win outright uh, against the Chargers. Listen, the Chargers, first of all, they have had a very easy schedule to start the season. So I do think some of the numbers are a little bit inflated for Los Angeles. I think we're going to see a little bit of regression from this team as the season uh, moves on in the second half. I mean, they have played the Raiders. They have played the Panthers. They've played the Steelers, you know, solid Steelers team. They played the Chiefs. They played the Broncos. They played the Cardinals. They played the Saints without Derek Carr. They played the Browns. So how many teams is that with a winning record right now? I guess a few. I guess the Chiefs, I guess the Steelers, I guess the – yeah, so winning records, but still. Outside of the Chiefs, they've played no elite teams. That's going to inflate their record a little bit. They've also played against some horrific teams. The Browns are horrific. The Raiders are horrific. The Panthers are horrific. The Saints without Derek Carr were hor- horrific. I think their numbers are a little bit inflated, and the best part of the Chargers is their defense, and that is the one area the Titans can kind of match them. Maybe the Titans' defense isn't quite as good as Los Angeles's, uh, but they do have, obviously, a very good defense. Tennessee allows fewer yards per play. They give up 4.7 compared to 5.1 of Los Angeles. Uh, The Chargers are second in the NFL in opponent success rate. The Titans are right behind them coming in at third. Uh, And the Chargers, I mean, we know the receiving core is young inexperienced and certainly not the strength of their team so with how good the Titans secondary is they have a chance to just completely shut down the receivers and if they do this is going to come down to a game of who can run the ball better and stop the other team from doing so and whoever can get a couple more bounces that sounds like a game that I'm willing to take a shot on the three to one underdog I'm not going to make the case you know that the Titans should be favored But once again, just like the Bengals over the Ravens, this is a spot where I think we're getting some pretty good value on a huge underdog. Uh, Even net yards per play, Chargers 16th, Titans 19th. I think if I broke this, I think if I, you know, did a blind test and just listed where these teams rank in all these different metrics, and I told you you could take Team A at minus whatever 450 or Team B at plus 310, I think a blind test, a blind resume, I think you would take the Titans plus 310. Let's get crazy this week. Let's, this is, I don't want to say it's a heat check because I haven't been hot the past couple weeks, but this is kind of like, uh, this is kind of a, a, you know, let's go for kind of week. If we cash in on both the Bengals and Titans, we are absolutely laughing this week. Even if we hit one on one of them, we're in a pretty good spot. So that's, that's my second upset of the week. I'll take the Titans plus 310 um, at home. No, they're on the road, on the road in uh, Los Angeles. But, I mean, do the Chargers have home field advantage? They might have the worst home field advantage in the NFL. Uh, Jets-Cardinals. I will take the Jets once again. I bet on the Jets last week because I thought they were better in the record. They proved it against the Texans. They shot themselves in the foot and still managed to, to win the game. I mean, what's that receiver's name? Malachi Corley? Uh, I know this point has been kind of, you know... Uh, it's beating a dead horse at this point, but like, what are these players doing dropping the ball before the goal line? Like it's the most baffling thing in my 31 years of watching sports. It just, it happens so often. If I was in the NFL, I would not be letting go of the ball until a ref like ripped it over my hands. And these guys are dropping it before they get in. And it's happening so often. I don't know how players or why players keep doing it truly the most baffling thing I witness on a monthly basis. Uh, With that being said, the Jets still managed to win the game, still managed to cover the spread. I think this is a huge sell high spot on the Cardinals. I don't think the Cardinals are nearly as good as they've, as their record recently. I don't think they're nearly as good as their public perception. They are all offense, no defense. Their defense still ranks 28th in the league in opponent EPA per play. It is a glaring weakness for them. Meanwhile, the Jets' secondary remains one of the best in the league. They lead the NFL in opponent dropback success rate, third in the NFL in opponent yards per pass attempt. If the Jets can move the ball offensively while also shutting down the Cardinals' pass attack, it's going to be hard for Arizona to win this game. I will take the Jets plus one, uh, minus 110 against the Cardinals. Eagles against the Cowboys. Uh, Is anyone betting on the Cowboys this week? 
not only do you have a team that has been horrific all season, both record-wise and metrics-wise, uh, but now Dak Prescott is out. So Cooper Rush is going to be their starting quarterback. How are the Cowboys going to compete? Unless the only possibility that could lead to the Cowboys competing in this game is if the issues with the Cowboys offense has actually been Dak Prescott and Cooper Rush ends up being the better option at quarterback. If that option, if that happens, maybe they cover the spread here. But still, they're bottom 10 in just about every single metric. It's not just their offense. Their defense is 30th in opponent EPA per play. Only the Panthers and Jaguars have been worse in terms of opponent EPA. Um, and the Eagles, I've talked about it now for a couple weeks. I know they didn't cover last week, but this Eagles team um, is starting to look like the number two team in the NFC behind only the Lions. So um, I think the Eagles run away with this, quite literally run away with this. Because the worst aspect, as bad as the Cowboys are, the worst aspect of this team is their ability to stop the run. And who runs the ball the best in the NFL? Probably the Ravens, number one, but the Eagles would be number two. I think they run the ball early and often in this game. They run it down the Cowboys' throat. They win this game by 14 points. This, If you want to do like an alt spread at plus money, this might be a game where you can do an alt spread. So I'll take Eagles minus seven, minus 105. Uh, Sunday night football. Uh, it is the Lions. It is the Texans. Um, this is one of my favorite bets of the week. It is actually a total bet. I'm actually going to take the under. I don't know why this under, why this total is so high. It actually, I want to go back and yeah, under 49. Why is this at 49? I know if you just like think of the Lions and Texans, you might think like, oh, these are two great offenses. You got Jared Goff, MVP contender, Jameer Gibbs, Dave Montgomery, Amon Ross St. Brown, and then you got the Texans, you got CJ Stroud. Uh, Nico Collins, I think actually might be back this week. Did I make that up? It doesn't matter. These two teams actually have two of the best defenses in the entire NFL. It's shocking, but they do. Heading into this week, the Lions rank 5th and 8th in opponent EPA. Um, the Texans, uh, actually, sorry, these two teams rank 5th and 8th in opponent EPA. Uh, the Texans lead the NFL in opponent success rate as well. And recently, the, the Lions defense has been quietly the best in the NFL, actually. Since week 6, the Lions lead the NFL in opponent EPA. They come in 4th in opponent success rate. Um, both teams are actually very good on third down as well. If you look at like opponent third down EPA, opponent third down success rate, um, these two teams, especially as of late, especially over the past four weeks have been top five defenses in the NFL. Even if you even look at the season long numbers, the worst you can say about these two teams is they're both top 10 defenses. That's the worst. If you say, if you say they're... If you say they're anything outside the top 10 defensively, then you're just incorrect. So let's just say we have a game between two teams who have top 10 defenses in the NFL, yet the total's at 49? That makes no sense to me. The Lions might actually be better defensively than offensively, believe it or not. The Texans are definitely better defensively than off offensively. CJ Stroud is at a regression uh, this season compared to last season, still been a good quarterback, but he has clearly had a regression from last season to this season. A little bit of a sophomore slump. Um, I want to get this Nico Collins news here. I don't know why in my head. Okay, so there is a chance Nico Collins plays this week. I didn't make that up. Is eligible to return from injured injured reserve this week. Okay, so I didn't make that up. Nico Collins might be back. Still, I don't care. I think the under... Uh, is the right play in this game. It's might be my number one favorite bet of the entire week. I just defense is these this good. Forty nine is a crazy total. I'd like I set this total at like forty six. Like obviously for me to set the total of forty six, I'm probably seeing something wrong because there's no way my line should be three points different from what the set line is. Um, but I got to stick with it. I I love the under here. Love it. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with Monday Night Football. It is uh, the Rams and the Dolphins. Uh, and I will take the Rams minus two and a half. I'm going to go against my Dolphins, who I've been betting on uh, a lot this season. I will go against them on Monday Night Football, take the Rams minus two and a half. And it is because...
We saw last season, remember the Rams after their bye week, 7-1 and one after their bye week, 7-1 and one through their last eight games. They were the hottest team in the second half of the season. We may see the same thing happening this week because the Rams, since their bye week, 3-0, they've won all three games, and it's not just their record. It is their metrics have been off the board uh, over that stretch as well. Obviously, getting Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup back in their lineup that's obviously going to improve the offense by a significant margin. But what's not being talked about is actually how much better their defense has been since the bye week. So I got the numbers here from week one to week six. Week six was, was their bye. So from week one to week, week six, the Rams ranked 31st in the NFL in opponent EPA per play. From week seven through week nine, so the last three weeks, they ranked second in the NFL an opponent EPA per play. And it's not like they've been playing the three worst offenses. Now, they did play the Raiders their first game back. That obviously uh, is a bad offense, but then played the Vikings and played the Seahawks. So you can't just point to how easy their opponents have been the past three weeks. They have played two good offenses and one bad offense. So they have once again went from pre by week based on EPA from, P- from pre by week second worst off- defense in the NFL to post by week the second best defense in the NFL. We might be seeing the Rams go on another second half of the season run, just like we did last year. Healthy offense, much improved defense, uh, and healthier defense too, for that matter. I will take the Rams minus two and a half on Monday night football. All right, I will recap the picks and then give you my best bets uh, and my teaser, uh, we got Bengals plus 220 to upset the Ravens on Thursday night football in Germany. We got, uh, Giants minus four and a half minus 110, uh, Patriots bears under 39 and a half Vikings minus four Steelers commanders under 46, uh, Colts plus four and a half Broncos plus nine and a half minus 115 against the chiefs Falcons minus three minus 115 against the saints. 49ers minus six and a half minus 105 against the Buccaneers Titans plus 310 on the money line against the Chargers Jets plus one against the Cardinals Eagles minus seven minus 105 against the Cowboys Lions Texans under 49 minus 110 Rams minus two and a half minus 110 that is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen game 14 picks for 14 games with four teams on by this week last week i did go three and two at a winning week for my uh best bets last week we cashed in Bengals to cover against the raiders we also cashed in on vikings minus five and a half and buccaneers plus nine we lost on cowboys and we lost on bears uh the Bengals, or sorry the teaser last week was extremely easy Bengals minus one and a half against the raiders vikings pick them against the colts both of them covered just the closing number so obviously taking them on six point teasers one as well that was a sweat free winner on the teaser this week, my ten, my week 10 best bets. I'm going to go with the Bengals again. Now, for the sake of the best bets, um, I do point spread instead of money line underdog. Um, bet it how you want. But for uh, my best bets, I just do spread in total. Bengals plus six. Titans plus seven and a half. So, obviously, the two money line upsets, I'm just going to take them with the points. Vikings minus four against the Jaguars. Eagles minus seven against the Cowboys. And then Lions, Texans under 49. So, once again, my five best bets for this week. Bengals, Titans, Vikings, Eagles, all to cover. Lions, Texans on Sunday Night Football to go under. My teaser of the week, six-point teaser of the week, we are going to tease the Eagles down from uh, minus seven down to minus one. That is obviously getting off the key number of seven. It is crossing the key number of three, and we're basically turning it into a pick against Cooper Rush. And then we're going to take the Jets up from plus one to plus seven we are crossing the key number of three we're getting to the key number of seven uh in hopes that the jets defense can shut down kyler murray and make this into a pretty uh close game so teaser eagles minus one jets plus seven on a six point teaser uh and i think that is all for uh this week uh the bacon bet survivor pool it took about what six weeks for to get down to two people and now those two guys i think have both won their picks uh in three straight weeks i think three or four straight weeks they've won their picks so uh this the bacon bet survivor pool still continues on to week 10 uh first man to blink loses 
Um, and if they both lose in the same week, then it just keeps going to the next week. Uh, so good luck to those guys who are still alive in the Bacon Bet Survivor Pool. Uh, and I think that is it for the show. Teaser, best bets, recap, that's it. Thank you all so much for watching and listening. As always, please, 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 if you're watching this on YouTube and, and you're not subscribed to the Bacon Bets podcast, subscribe to it now. Please rate and review the audio version of this podcast if you can. Leave a comment on the YouTube section letting me know your best bet for this week. Um, gamble or bless. I'll be back Thursday morning with my best player props for this week for the player prop countdown. Thank you all so much for watching and listening, and I'll talk to you then.